Good morning, my name is Kathy Hoffman. I am a CRNA. I am also on the OAAPN Board of Directors. I am Chair of Communications and also Chair of the Key Person Program. And that is why I am giving you this talk about the process of legislation and how it affects our modernization bills, which is essentially House Bill 216. Let's talk about basic government and the legislative process. Each two-year legislative cycle is called the General Assembly. We are in Ohio's 131st General Assembly. In this time, all legislation has to go through the entire process, from draft introduction all the way to signing by the governor by December 31st of that second year. If the bill does not get through the whole process, it's probably because either A, it was voted down, or B, the bill died for lack of time. If the bill dies, the sponsor must introduce the bill again in the next General Assembly. There may be the same sponsor, it may be a different sponsor. There are new players in the field. The legislature changes at the end of a General Assembly. New legislators will be in the House and in the Senate. All these things affect the bill's movement through this process. Some political factors and time frames that affect the bill's movement through the process include the budget. Let's say there's a budget bill and that takes high priority compared to other bills and therefore other bills will not be heard. Another thing that can slow process is during an election year. During an election year, our legislators go on recess from about Memorial Day till after the election, so mid-November, before they come back to the State House to work on our legislation. The Ohio House of Representatives has 99 members and the Ohio Senate has 33 members. This is different and unique from our federal government. Ohio has 16 U.S. representatives and two U.S. senators that work in Washington, D.C. Back here at the Ohio State House, there is a House and a Senate. Each chamber has committees. Both the chamber and the committees have a hierarchy of leadership. Why do we care about that? because leadership is important because it is the leaders of the committee and the chamber that determine which bills will be on the agenda to be heard and which bills will be voted upon. The Ohio House Health and Aging Committee has Ann Gonzalez as a chair. There are two physician members of the committee as well as several members that have physician relatives. This has had an impact on the movement of House Bill 216. The Senate Medicaid Committee is where Senate Bill 279 currently resides. The chair of that committee is a pharmacist, Dave Burke, and we are hopeful that House Bill 216 will be assigned to his committee in the fall. Back to the legislative process. A senator or a representative sponsors a bill that they feel is important based on the wishes of a constituent or a group or organization. That group or organization can give the sponsor some language they would like to have, and that is their dream bill. That's everything they would love to see in this group of legislation. However, anybody who has ever been involved with the legislative process realizes that it's very unusual for that dream bill to actually be signed by the government sometime within that two-year process. The first hearing in a committee is sponsor testimony. Sponsor testimony is when the sponsor tells the committee how he or she thinks the bill will help Ohioans. Then the proponents and opponents of the bill have a chance to address the committee to tell them why they think the bill should pass or should not pass. So the proponents and opponents, the people that care about what happens with that legislation, they're called interested parties and they work with the sponsor and with each other to negotiate and determine how they can make the bill passable for both sides what can still help the people and the people sponsoring the bill, but what kind of things they might need to take out of the bill to make the opponents neutral on the bill. When there is some agreed upon language, that language is submitted to the sponsor and the bill is redrafted in the LSC into a new version. And this can happen several times. If and when the sponsor feels that the bill will pass the committee vote, the sponsor asks the committee chair to put the bill up for a vote. If that bill passes in the committee, then it moves to the whole chamber to be voted upon. It is very common that if a bill has passed the committee, it will also pass 
in the whole chamber. You think the work's done there, it's not. It still has to go all the way to the other chamber and go through that entire process again. If the bill gets through the second chamber, but there have been changes, it is sent to something called a conference committee. The conference committee has three representatives and three senators, and they work to reconcile the differences in the bill before it is sent to the governor for signature. All that has to happen before December 31st of the second year of that General Assembly and the bill becomes law 90 days after the governor signs the bill. Let's talk about House Bill 216 and its journey through this legislative process. Back in the early winter months of 2015, our dream bill was created. On May 19th of 2015, Representative Polanda introduced our language as her bill. It was called House Bill 216. On May 25th, 2016, version 9 of House Bill 216 passed the Health Committee unanimously and passed the full House with an 86 to 1 vote. The one no vote was from Representative Naraj Antani of the 42nd District in Montgomery County. We were really excited and thrilled and I know our dream bill didn't pass and some people are disappointed and we understand that. However, there are still really good provisions in version 9 of House Bill 216 and that's what we need to be excited about. However, we still have a long way to go. Now the legislators are out for the whole campaign season and they come back into what is called lame duck session in the middle of November. There they will have a few hearings, and in that time, our bill has to get through that whole Senate, through proponent testimony, through opponent testimony, any differences reconciled with the House, and then it has to get to the governor for signature by December 31st. And I want, for one, hope to be there if it actually gets signed. I know you've probably heard about Senate Bill 279. Senate Bill 279 was assigned to the Medicaid Committee of the Senate on February 23rd, 2016. There have been no hearings on that bill to this point, and there probably won't be, because House Bill 216 is now the moving vehicle for our modernization language. As I said, this was a very contentious bill, and there had to be a lot of negotiations and concessions to get the legislators to a more neutral position. And how do we know if they're neutral or not? Well, our lobbyists go around and talk to every legislator in the health committee and to determine where they are on their thought processes. Are they supportive? Are they neutral? Will they vote yes? Will they vote no? And our lobbyists realized and told the OAPN that more concessions would have to happen to make our bill pass. They are also working very closely with our sponsor, Representative Palanda. All these negotiations take time. So that has affected House Bill 216. This is also election year, so once again, time is of the essence. As I mentioned before, the Health Committee is very physician-centric in makeup. There are two physicians on the committee, as well as some members that have either a spouse or a child that are physicians. So therefore, they're gonna be more biased towards organized medicine's opinions. The current Ohio legislator also has a culture of incrementalism. They don't like to make huge sweeping changes. Our legislator seems to be very conservative, so you have to expect to take baby steps in any big change that you would like to have. And finally, and most importantly, a lot of the legislators do not understand how APRMs practice. I did some of those town hall meetings, and at those meetings, I realized that there are legislators that had no idea how much nurse practitioners do, have no idea how CRNAs practice. And it takes me, but also every one of you, to help educate those legislators so they understand what we do and are more willing to pass our legislation. Despite all these negative factors, when you think about it, we really aren't doing so badly. It took over six years of hard work and dedication for Schedule II prescriptive authority to get passed. And when you think about it, House Bill 216 has nine versions already, but there's a really good chance that we may pass this bill by the end of this year, which is only one General Assembly. So we do have some reason to be happy and excited. So let's go over the major changes of House Bill 216. Our dream bill consisted of retiring the Collaborative Agreement, or SCA, retiring the CPG and the current formulary, removing supervision for CRNAs, and allowing prescriptive authority for CRNAs. As we talked about, a lot of negotiations had to happen and version three was released in December of 2015. Version three still retired the SCA for nurse practitioners, CNSs, and nurse midwives. 
However, it retains supervision for the CRNAs. Some other major changes of version 3 included an externship certificate that would be issued with the initial APRN license to new graduates. And this was in response to the legislators saying that they were worried that the new grads would not be ready to practice on their own without the SCA and without physician oversight. Version 3 also granted limited prescriptive authority to the CRNA so that they could order medication during the course of their anesthetic as well as during clinical support functions. Version 3 had no formulary mentioned in it. Another major change of version 3 was regarding continuing education. The CE requirement every two years would be bumped up to 48 credits, 24 credits for both the RN and the APRN license. For CNSs, nurse midwives, and nurse practitioners, 12 of those 24 credits must be in pharmacology. And this piece has remained current in version 9. So all these changes occurred, however, organized medicine was still not happy. Are we surprised? No. So, as I said before, the lobbyists were working with Representative Palanda and with the Health Committee and realized more compromise and more concessions would need to be made. And a lot of these changes occurred very rapidly this past spring. At one point, the SCA was put back into the language except for there was a carve out for psych APRNs because the legislators realize that psych APRNs have a really difficult time finding collaborators and there's a huge need for psychiatric care in the state of Ohio. The formulary was put back in as well as the CPG. However, this formulary was an exclusionary formulary, so that's better. All these rapid changes occurred and finally version 9 was released and voted upon like we talked about earlier. Version 9 essentially removed all CRNA language. It has an exclusionary formulary and a CPG. All APRNs, including the psych nurses, retain the SCA, and it removed the ability to sign death certificates. However, House Bill 216 still has some good things in it that will remove some barriers, help our practice, and essentially help our patients. So, some of the successes of version 9. First of all, there will be an exclusionary formulary versus the 45-page inclusionary formulary that we used to have. The CPG is back, but there will be parity. There will be an equal number of APRNs and physicians on the CPG committee. There will be a pharmacist on the committee still. However, they will only be used as a resource and will not have a vote. And in order to get a medication on the do not prescribe list, an APRN has to agree. The externship to attain this certificate to prescribe is being retired. There will be a 120 day buffer period if the collaborating physician is lost to the practice. That gives the nurse practitioner time to continue seeing her patients and keep her practice going, as well as be looking for a new collaborating physician. The details of that little piece are going to be worked out over the summer. Another thing that will be very helpful for APRNs is that the ratio of APRN to physician is increasing from three to one to five to one. So it will make it a little bit easier, hopefully, to find collaborating physicians. And psych APRNs will be allowed to collaborate with family and pediatric physicians instead of just psychiatrists. So all these things are helping to remove barriers and will hopefully help increase access for our patients in Ohio. Some other positive impacts of the bill are that version 9 removes restrictions on sample medications. It extends the recognition of pharmacology courses from three to five years. It removes Schedule II site restrictions for assisted living facilities. It provides APRNs and patients the protection of the APRN patient privilege, similar to the physician or lawyer client privilege. It also allows APRNs to serve as the attending provider of record for admitted patients. Some wins in regards to the Board of Nursing. There will now be two seats for APRNs on the Board of Nursing and an advisory committee, an APRN advisory committee, will also be established. That committee will have representation from the four different specialties and will be there to answer questions regarding our practice for the Board of Nursing and be able to discuss how their rules and regulations may affect our practice, may affect our patients. Those are all good things. Also, APRN will become an umbrella term for all four specialties and we will have an APRN and an RN license. You can find a full list 
of version 9 successes at oapn.org. So what's next? We still have a lot of work to do and very little time to do it in. Lame duck session, as I said, starts mid-November. House Bill 216 version 9 needs to move to the Senate, will likely go to the Senate Medicaid Committee. Proponent and opponent testimony needs to be heard. The committee will need to vote. The whole Senate will need to vote. And if there are any changes, the bill will have to be reconciled in conference committee before it can be sent to the governor. All that has to happen by December 31st. And then we will definitely be celebrating again. <laughs> what can you do? How can you help? It can't just be your board working here. You need everybody to help. And relationships are crucial. And this is your time to establish a relationship with your legislator. Again, you want to find your Ohio Senator and Representative, and you can find that on legislator.ohio.gov, and you enter your zip code plus four, and your representative and senator will be listed. You want to call them, make an appointment. Repetitive contact is important. You want to be able to strike up a conversation, an interesting conversation with them. And you can find material for that by looking at their bio on the website and following the legislator on social media. You may have a sport in common. You may have gone to the same high school or college. You may have some other passion like feeding the homeless or something in common that you can strike up a conversation about and that gives that little personal touch to your relationship. Consider going to a town hall meeting or a fundraiser for that legislator. The local fundraisers usually cost between $50 and $100. At that fundraiser, you can meet other legislators. You may have a chance to tell several people about your practice and what APRNs do. You can also offer to be a resource to your legislator and their family for any health-related questions they may have. That will keep them coming back to you. Offer to help with their campaign, stuff envelopes, make phone calls, put a sign in your yard, march in a local parade. That actually can be kind of fun. Most of the time, the legislators go to state fairs. Summer is the time for state fairs. Go find them there and say hello, introduce yourself, get to know them a little bit better each time. If you already have the relationship built, when an issue comes up, half the work's already done. And you want to go and first talk to your legislator and find out what they already know about that issue. And you want to know your issue very well. Carry talking points, whether it's on a piece of paper, whether it's on your smartphone, however you're comfortable but also know the opponent's point of view and be able to address that point of view. For example, Legislator Brown, the OSMA will tell you that APRNs do not have the education to practice without physician oversight. However, I disagree for three reasons. First, APRNs have master's and doctoral degrees and are very well trained for their scope of practice. Number two, the APRNs collaborate professionally with their physicians based on the needs of the patients. And finally, in many, many practices, the physician that is a tied to the SCA has very little involvement with the actual day-to-day -day practice of that APRN. Try to make your examples pertinent to your own practice and your own locality, the patients in your district. And that, again, brings it more home for the legislator. So, instead of bashing your opponent, you want to be respectful of your opponents and you want to support your ideas with positive research. You want to emphasize how that legislation, how your issue will help Ohioans, will help that legislator's constituents. That's very important to them. You want to leave a one-pager uh, or a folder or something nice that highlights the positive points of your issue. So it's very important that you don't argue, threaten, or become sarcastic. And I will say that's a little bit hard for me, <laughs> the first two a minute. Don't guess. If you don't know the answer, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, but I will get the answer for you. And then make sure you email them with the answer or call them with the answer in a reasonable amount of time. If you have a small group going to talk to the legislator together, Coordinate your plan of speaking ahead of time so that everybody has a chance to say something and you're not interrupting each other. It's good to have a leader who knows the issue maybe the best and that leader can help steer the conversation as it tends to ebb and flow. Then don't be afraid to ask the big question, will you support our legislation? What can we do to make you support the legislation? What, can we, what questions can we answer for you? That will help and then you get that information back to your legislator and you may have just turned a non-supporter or a neutral person into a supporter. 
Finally, at the very end, when you go home, write a thank you note. Thank them for their time. Thank them for their support and ask or encourage them to support the bill depending on the situation. And always send your card with your contact information with that thank you note. So what do we need you to do this fall? I think I've said it enough. Call and visit your legislators, especially your senators, because our bill is moving into the Senate in lame duck session and there's only about six weeks in which it needs to pass. You can become a key person. A key person is someone who has committed to establishing a relationship with their legislator. We have about 80 key persons right now. You will not be left alone. You'll be guided through the process and you will receive emails at pertinent times from me as things develop. You'll be on the cutting edge of the information regarding our legislation. And it's really important that we keep this program going because in this fall there's going to be elections and I am sure we're going to have some sort of legislation coming up in the future and you need to keep these relationships established and establish relationships with the new legislators that come in so that half the work is already done when we have our issue. Finally, respond to the call to actions that the OAPN sends out. Look for your email. When we put a call to action out, we thought hard about it because we don't just put them out for the heck of it. We put it out when we really need people to do something en masse and quickly. So please pay attention to those. And finally, money talks. Donate to your PAC. I can guarantee you that our opposition has contributed much more money to the legislators than the OAPN has the ability to do so. If you have any questions about this conversation, I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person, but please email info at oaapn.org and our executive director will get the question to the appropriate person so that we can get you an answer in a reasonable amount of time. Have a great day.